Guatemala's geography has decisively shaped much of the country's history, its conflicts, patterns of development, and its culture. To see why, join me for this brief look at the political geography of Guatemala. Once part of a much larger territory, Guatemala is the 105th largest country in the world and the 15th biggest in Latin America, quite small for the region's standards. So much so that even if it had retained all of Belize's land, which it claimed originally and still claims part of, it would still only make it about the size of Nicaragua. The country's main geographical feature are the various mountain ranges that crisscross it, dividing its territory between the ocean and the lowlands of the Petén. The highlands make it the 45th country with the highest average elevation at 759 meters or 2,490 feet, lower than the world average but higher than any other country in Central America. Its highest point, an extinct volcano known as Volcán Tajumulco, is also the tallest in Central America. That it is an extinct volcano is not a coincidence. Guatemala is the country with the most volcanic activity in Central America and in the top five in Latin America, with five active volcanoes since 1950, including perhaps its most famous, Volcán del Fuego, known for its eruptions, the most recent being in December 2022. Given how mountainous the country is, temperatures vary widely across the Guatemalan landscape, with the lowlands averaging between 27 and 30 degrees Celsius, or low 80s Fahrenheit, while the Highland Valley's average is nearly 10 degrees Celsius or 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit lower. This also makes for varied ecoregions with 10 within the Klopp and Geiger scale, ranging from polar tundra to tropical rainforest. Guatemala is the ninth Latin American country with the most people, with around 17 million inhabitants, just below Ecuador's 18 million. This translates to the 58th most densely populated country in the world with 166 people per square kilometer, one of the highest in Latin America and surpassed in Central America only by El Salvador. Around 17% of the country's total population live in the nation's capital, Guatemala City, while the rest lives disproportionately in the country's highlands, with the largest cities outside the capital itself being Cobán and Quetzaltenango. Many of these people are indigenous, as Guatemala is the country in the Americas with the highest percentage of native people as a percentage of the total population. The Guatemalan government usually divides the country into eight zones that map into their political subdivisions, what they call departamentos. There are 22 of these, and they are the equivalent of what other countries call states or provinces, although their governors are not directly elected but appointed by the president. If we try to keep closer to cultural and natural divisions, however, we can collapse these into six broader zones. These are the Petén, or Northern Lowlands, the Caribbean, Eastern Guatemala, the Western Highlands, the Central Highlands, and the Pacific Lowlands. We begin with the Petén. Generally ignored for most of its history by the government, it is the largest and least populated mostly due to the dense rainforest that covers it. Historically one of the civilization centers of the ancient Maya, their ruins still dot its landscape in places like Topoxte, Nakum, and Huasactum. The most famous by far, however, is Tikal, the remnants of a kingdom that reached its peak between 200 and 900 AD. The Spanish first showed up in the area when an expedition by Hernán Cortés traversed the region in 1525 on its way to Honduras. The encounter with the locals, the Itzamaya, was peaceful and did not immediately lead to European colonization. In fact, it would not be until a century later when the Spanish tried to incorporate the area into their empire under the leadership of Francisco de Mirones, but failed badly. Another seven decades would pass before they tried again, and in 1696, Martín de Ursúa would lead an assault on the capital of the Itza kingdom, the Nogpetén, destroying the city and prompting the survivors to flee into the jungle. It was the last independent indigenous kingdom to be conquered by the Spanish. Today, the city of Flores stands on the island where the Itza capital stood, a pleasant colonial town connected to the mainland with a causeway. The other important sites of note in this region are its national parks, including the largest, the Laguna del Tigre National Park, and its most diverse, Sierra de la Candón National Park with all sorts of mammals, birds, and reptiles, like the endemic species spider and howler monkeys, Aluta pigra and Ateles yofroyi, as well as Moralette's crocodile. Best known of all, however, because of its importance in Mayan iconography, is the jaguar, the largest cat species native to the Americas. Next is the Caribbean, the smallest of the zones. Historically, this was the main link of the Spanish Kingdom of Guatemala to the rest of the world, but the climate made it a difficult area to populate and control. 
1644, the Spanish built the Castillo de San Felipe, a fort at the entrance of Lake Izabal used to defend against pirates. Today, you can still visit our restored version, a nice view from where to see the largest lake in the country. Even after independence, Guatemalan authorities had trouble developing the region, so in 1843, the strongman at the time, Rafael Carrera, allowed the establishment of a Belgian colony in what is now Santo Tomás de Castilla. The territory was supposed to be ceded to Belgium in perpetuity, but the Europeans could barely make it a decade as the area was beset with malaria and yellow fever. Today, little of it remains beyond the cemetery just outside of Santo Tomás. Development, to the extent there was any, finally came with the establishment of Puerto Barrios in 1895. The new port was originally envisioned as a transshipment point to carry the coffee from the farms of the president and his friends, but when coffee prices crashed, it later became the United Fruits main seaport in Guatemala, shipping mostly bananas instead. The other thing that remains that's unique to the area is Guatemala's main original Pacific port, Livingston. Founded in 1831, it is noted for its Afro-Caribbean, Native, and Mestizo mix, and especially its Garifuna heritage, a people of mixed African and indigenous blood who originated in the Caribbean island of St. Vincent and were transferred to Central America by the British. This is evident in the local culture and food in dishes like tapado, a flavorful soup made out of seafood, plantain, yucca, coconut milk, and fresh spices. Once almost unknown, tourists are much more common now especially after one of its beaches was used as the background for the opening scene in the 2019 film Terminator Dark Fate. The other reason for the increase in tourism are its multiple national parks like the Parque Cuervas de Silvino, a natural system of caves, and the Parque Rio Dulce. The latter was established in 1955, making it the second oldest in Guatemala and features manatees and crocodiles. We now move on to eastern Guatemala, a region where a number of key events in the history of the country occurred. The most important was the Battle of La Rada, just outside of the town of Chiquimula on February 2, 1851. This was part of a broader conflict between liberals and conservatives in Central America, and at this particular moment, a combined army between Honduras and El Salvador attempted to conquer the country and establish a liberal regime which might even lead to the recreation of a Central American Republic. Instead, the Guatemalans won, ensuring an independent Guatemala up to the present day and the official beginning of Rafael Carrera as president for life. A more recent event celebrated by Guatemalans that took place in this region was a meeting in May 1986 that established a peace process that successfully ended the Guatemalan Civil War, a conflict that had raged for decades. The agreement was named after the town where the original meeting took place, Esquipulas, a location just a few miles from both Honduras and El Salvador. That it took place here was somewhat symbolic because it was in this region that one of the anti-government guerrillas, the FARC, or Armed Rebel Forces, first emerged, a group famous for their radical tactics such as kidnapping and murdering of various ambassadors, including one from the United States, John Gordon Mott. The town of Esquipulas itself, however, is best known for its Black Christ, a darkened wooden image enshrined within the local cathedral basilica, which has made it an important center of Catholic pilgrimage since at least the 17th century, but especially after 1740 when according to legend the Black Christ healed Guatemala's bishop, Pedro Pardo de Figueroa, a miracle which led to the construction of the cathedral. The next region is the Pacific Lowlands. Historically, the area was always seen as having potential with the development of a Pacific port that might be connected to an Atlantic one to encourage trade. Instead, because of a lack of investment, bad policy, and problems on the Caribbean side for most of its history, the largest one was San Jose, which was barely adequate. In fact, it was not until the 1980s that major investment constructed a modern nearby port, Puerto Quetzal, today the largest in the country. Thus, instead of an industrial hub, the area has a long history of coffee production grown on its edges as one descends from 6,500 to 2,500 feet, the equivalent of 1980 to 763 meters. Grown along the highland slopes since the 19th century, today this zone has a number of regional coffees such as the Acatenango Valley, an activity you can see for yourself in the various fincas around the region. Another one of the area's main attractions are of course its beaches, although most are laid back places with little tourist infrastructure. The best known, in part because it's less than three hours from the capital, is Monte Rico. Famous for its volcanic black sand beach and the annual influx of sea turtles, it is a good place to try the local ceviche, a version usually made with shrimp and Worcestershire sauce. 
The other thing that brings people to this part of the country is the Carnaval de Mazatenango, one of the largest carnivals in Guatemala. Officially established in 1885, it features a parade and the selection of a queen and the ugly carnival king. Finally, while historically few Guatemalans of note have come from this region, the one that did significantly shape the country for the worse. The guy in question was Carlos Castillo Armas. Born in Santa Lucia, Cozumagualpa, in 1914, he was responsible for ending the promise of the Guatemalan Revolution in 1954 when he ended the country's democracy with an armed revolt backed by the United States. He would go on to become president and usher in a period of authoritarianism that would last decades. We now move on to the Western Highlands, a region that historically speaking has been the second most important in the country. It was here, for example, that in 1524 the Spanish first arrived in Guatemala. Led by Pedro de Alvarado, it was also here that they first encountered resistance by the local Quiche, an ethnically Maya people that controlled the surrounding area of what is now Quetzaltenango. The Quiche rallied around their leader, the Cunumán, who died fighting the Spanish and became a legend, and today is one of Guatemala's national heroes. Unfortunately for the Quiche, their attempt was unsuccessful, but the rebellious streak in the locals remained. In 1820, there was a brief rebellion against the Spanish colonial government that came to be known as the Totonicapan Uprising. Then, at different points in the late 1830s and 1840s, this region declared itself independent with its capital set at Quetzaltenango and under the name of Los Altos. It might well have succeeded in remaining a sovereign country, but Rafael Carrera invaded and put down their aspirations. Twice. Despite its failure, it did contribute to the Guatemalan national symbols as Los Altos was the first part of the Guatemalan territory to use the Quetzal bird on its flag, the main distinctive feature of the current banner. Meanwhile, rebellions continued in 1897 when the then Guatemalan president, José María Reina Barrios, attempted to keep himself in power beyond his constitutional limits, sparking what the Guatemalans call the Quetzalteca Revolution. It was also put down, but indirectly probably led to the assassination of Reina Barrios less than six months later. Finally, in more recent times, it was here that another one of the main rebel guerrillas against the government during the Civil War first emerged, the Ejército Guerrillero de los Pobres, or Guerrilla Army of the Poor. Unfortunately, because of the EGP's presence, this area suffered a disproportionate number of deaths and disappearances at the hands of the government, especially under the rule of Rios Montt, a military dictator who also happened to be from this region. More happily for visitors and locals today, the area also boasts one of the most famous sites in the country, Lago de Atitlán, the deepest lake in Central America and one of the most beautiful. The lake is surrounded by Maya communities, many with their native tongue still as the primary language and all with their local traditions. The largest, for example, is Santiago Atitlán, a town noted for the worship of Maximón an idol that resulted from the syncretism of Christianity and Mayan deities and is said to be a trickster who represents the light and the dark. The most famous community on the lake, however, is Panajachel, or Pana, as the locals call it. It is the most touristy lake town and has seen its fair number of celebrities like Ingrid Bergman and Ernesto Che Guevara. Today, it is a popular destination a little over three hours from the capital city. Finally, we have reached the Central Highlands, the most historically important region in the country. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish, the area was dominated by a Mayan site known as Caminaljuyu and has been the center of power in the country since 1527 when the capital was set first near Ciudad Vieja, later Antigua, and still later present Guatemala City. As such, this region has produced most Guatemalans more likely to be recognized abroad. People like Miguel Ángel Asturias, Guatemala's first and only winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, Ricardo Arjona, one of Latin America's most famous songwriters, and Luis Bonan, a professor at Carnegie Mellon credited for inventing the CAPTCHA forms used in computers to stop bot attacks and automated programs. Then there are two others who came from more humble beginnings, Carlos El Pescadito Ruiz, Guatemala's best footballer and the second top scorer in the history of the MLS, as well as Rigoberta Menchu, a Quiche human rights activist who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992. It is also here where the country's most prestigious university is located, La Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala, the fourth oldest in the Americas and the only public Guatemalan university. More importantly for visitors, this region has some of the most iconic locations in the country. The first is Semuc Champé, a natural series of turquoise pools formed out of a limestone bridge over the Calbon River, a little over two hours from Cobán, itself a pleasant town famous for the German immigrants that settled it in the 19th century and its nearby coffee production. 
and perhaps the most recognizable of all, since it frequently serves as the image of the country, is Antigua, a picturesque colonial town that used to serve as Guatemala's capital until a 1717 earthquake damaged it so much that it convinced the country's leaders to move the capital to its present location. Given all of this, it is also not surprising that the country's national dish hails from here, the pepian, a thick meat stew that blends quite nicely Spanish and Indian traditions. Meanwhile, given how erratic Guatemalan politics have been since the country's return to democracy in 1996, particularly with how short-lived its political parties tend to be, there is no obvious geographical political pattern, but it should be noted that the 2023 election which might very well be the most important in modern Guatemalan history, left an interesting north to south division. Whether this will continue in the future is too early to say. That concludes our trip across the Guatemalan landscape. May you be lucky enough to visit in the near future.